Hey everyone, this week we're bringing you yet another Gen 2 Pokemon. Skarmory, the armor bird Pokemon. And I'm not complaining because I love Gen 2, but hey, I guess you guys just really love Gen 2 too, right? I gotta say, for a Pokemon whose inspiration was pretty clearly just bird that is metal, Game Freak did a pretty good job of making Skarmory look cool. In fact, my writer says that when he was a kid, he thought the red on Skarmory's wings was blood, which reminded him of the Stymphalian birds, legendary Greek birds that ate flesh and had metal wings. Nice. But unlike those aggressive avians though, what we've got here is a defensive behemoth. Wanna hear more? Let's get into it. How good was Skarmory actually? In this video, we'll cover the following competitive formats. Skarmory was introduced with the rest of the new steel types in Generation 2, and it was certainly a good poster child for what the type would come to mean for the competitive Pokemon metagame. While Skarmory's 140 defense couldn't quite compare to Steelix's absurd base 200 stat, 140 is nothing to scoff at. You know what's really no joke though? Skarmory's 9 resistances and 2 immunities in Gen 2. That's over half the types in the game that are gonna do less than half damage to this thing. And what's more, it's not weak to a single physical typing in the game. In fact, the only physical physical types it took even normal damage from were rock and fighting. It either resisted or was immune to everything else. That by itself should be case enough for Skarmory as one of the best physical walls in GSC, but it had its fair share of tools as well. That flying type did more than just land resistances. Skarmory's access to Whirlwind let it disrupt the momentum of teams attempting to set up with boosting moves or pass trap setups with Mean Look and Parasong, and it had its own boosting move and curse to boost its defense to absurd levels. Rest and leftovers gave it a good amount of reliable recovery, and while Skarmory's attack stat isn't the greatest, Drill Peck allowed it to threaten a good amount of damage on Machamp, Executor, and Heracross, all prominent threats in GSC. Skarmory's ability to tank and phase meant it served as a check to a large amount of top tier offensive Pokemon. Aside from the aforementioned flying weak trio, it could also wall out Marowak, Espeon, Quagsire, and even threaten the king of GSC, Snorlax. Set up Snorlax variants with Curse and Belly Drum were highly prone to getting phased, and even if they could set up, a plus one Skarmory can usually avoid being 3 hit KO'd by 900 999 attack, Snorlax is double edge. Yup, you heard that right. Even with the highest possible attack stat in GSC, Skarmory could shrug off Snorlax's moves. That also goes for a boosted Steelix explosion, a plus one critical hit cross chop from a champ, and other belly drum attackers like Marowak and Rhydon. The thing was a tank of unmatched proportions. Oh, and Curse's speed drop let it out phase other phasers since only the slower one worked in Gen 2. So what weaknesses did it have? Well, special attacks were honestly a pretty big one. Zapdos and Raikou were the other two most used Pokemon in GSC behind Snorlax. Snorlax. And Skarmory really did not like seeing either of those two. Due to its fairly limited move pool, it was pretty predictable and a total sitting duck, or crane, or whatever it is, when it was asleep from rest. Other special and mixed attackers like Nidoking, Tyranitar, and Dragonite gave it a pretty hard time, and it always had to be wary of the occasional fire blast from Snorlax. What's more, while Skarmory appreciated Spike set up a lot itself, to add even more utility to its phasing, it could get set up on itself very, very easily by Cloister or Fortress, and other cursed phasers like Titar and Steelace could underspeed it and phase it in turn. It is worth mentioning though, that all of these wannabe counters hate getting toxic, and that's without mentioning that there is pretty much half of the cast that Skarmory can just straight up wall. It had its answers, but it was a staple of many GSC teams and was placed in A- tier in Nintendo Cup and overused on the Smogan rankings. Remember how we just talked about how good Skarmory was with Spike support? Yeah, well in Gen 3, it became its own Spike support. Skarmory was one of the best Spike setters in the game, able to do its job simply and effectively and continued its reign as the undisputed best physical wall in the game. The introduction of Choice Band may have hindered its defensive prowess, but it also arguably helped Skarmory. With certain physical mods locked into a move that would barely dent its metal feathers, it could switch in easily easily and lay those nasty little spikes right under the other team's feet. As usual, Whirlwind makes it very hard to set up again, but interestingly enough, in Gen 3, Whirlwind and Drill Peck were an illegal move combination, so Hidden Power Flying was used as a passable replacement. Most sets now run Toxic and either Protect or Rest to stall instead of boosting with Curse, as it was especially good against Spinners who wanted to ruin Skarmory's carefully laid plans such as Claydol and Cloyster. Skarmory and Blissey formed such an intimidating defensive core that they became almost a meme, but it's true, Skarm Bliss was good. With Blissey's cleric abilities and the nice little bonus of tanking almost every special move in the game, Skarm Bliss could wreck unprepared or crippled teams. Skarmory also had a few more move pulls options this generation, with Rest Talk's additional survivability giving it an almost guaranteed method of setting up all three layers of spikes at the cost of its stalling power, and Taunt Sense designed to prevent other defensive Pokemon from setting up or healing. However, Skarmory did gain one of its truest counters this generation, Magneton. With its new ability in Magnet Pool, the fellow Steel-type could rely 
Shadow Bleed Trap and 1 hit KO Skarmory with Thunderbolt. Other strong options included Starmie, who likewise made use of its ability, in this case Natural Cure to heal Toxic, and then blasted Skarmory with some Righteous Lightning. And like we said earlier, it's only arguable that Choice Band was good for Skarmory. It also meant that with correct prediction, it could find itself grounded by physical moves, something it truly didn't expect in the early generations. Lore variants of physical sweeper Pokemon like Tyranitar and Metagross could catch it off guard, but the fact that those Pokemon would even run those moves to pick off Skarmory is a testament to how powerful it is. It was one of the most defining Pokemon in Generation 3, and to this day is top 4 in recent Gen 3 overused usage stats. In Generation 4, Stealth Rock is a thing and Skarmory can use it. So now you can choose between either Rocks or Spikes for Skarmory. You could use both if you really really wanted to, but you usually wouldn't want to, as it now boasted Roost and Brave Bird, two moves that solved its old problems of unreliable recovery and sh** damage. Roost could even help Skarmory in certain situations, giving it more resistance against Rock, Ice, and Electric moves, although it could of course also hurt it. And of course, the last slot went to Whirlwind, as always. Skarmory's most interesting alternative set this generation was actually a specially defensive set, which played almost the same in terms of moves, but allowed Skarmory to tank powerful Dragon, Ghost, and Grass-type special moves in the tier. And honestly, even without any physical defense investment, Skarmory could take a good amount of physical hits like a champ. In general though, Skarmory was about the same, setting up hazards, walling stuff, phasing, and occasionally taunting. Skarm Bliss lived on as without the specially defensive set, having something on your team to eat those moves was still a huge boon. In terms of counters, Skarmory's old foe Magneton had evolved, literally, into Magnezone who bopped Skarmory even harder. That said, the new item Shed Shell let Skarmory flee the first time it was trapped, although it did mean giving up Lefty's recovery. Aside from that, Heat Ram was a pretty good counter, able to switch in and kill it easily while taking minimal damage, but Skarmory stayed atop its perch as one of the best physical walls in overuse. You just can't deny that combination of utility and defense. Skarmory just keeps getting more tools. Gen 5 gave it a real ability in Sturdy, which now acted as a free focus sash. While Skarmory had new competition for the role of the premier spike setters in the form of Ferrothor, its ground immunity kept it relevant. The fact that a large amount of Gen 5 was played in either Rain or Sand was a huge boon to Skarmory, who benefited immensely from both weathers. In other meta-related news, the influx of fighting types in Gen 5 meant Skarmory's Brave Bird was a very real offensive threat to teams now. The taunt and specially defensive sets both stuck around, although this time the special defense investment was more to deal with bulky water types who Skarmory would frequently be dealing with in the rain. Its most interesting innovation came in the form of a lead set utilizing Custat Berry. For those of you who who aren't familiar, Custat Berry is a pinch berry that gives the Pokemon priority on the next move it uses when it activates. Comboed with Sturdy, the Skarmory set could guaranteed get up both Stealth Rocks and a layer of Spikes if it really wanted to. That said, the amount of Pokemon that could adequately handle hazards in general was growing even higher, and it's for that reason that the Custat set wasn't as popular. Magic Bouncers like Espeon and Zatu would ruin that Skarmory's day, and old but good Rapid Spinners like Starmie and Tentacruel still threaten Skarmory with their ability to both clear hazards and blast it with special moves. Skarmory's other checks included Gyarados and Gliscor, who could lure Skarmory out and then taunt it to garner a freeze turn for setup, and as always, Magazone, who eats any non-shed shell variant for lunch. But the pros still outweighed the cons, and Skarmory stayed comfortably in overuse. Remember that thing I said about Skarmory gaining new tools each gen? In Gen 6, that new tool was Defog, allowing it to become a hazard all-arounder, removing and setting them in turn. And by now, you guys know how Skarmory plays at this point in general, so let me just list the other ways it changed in Generation 6. With Fairy types now in existence, Skarmory's Steel Typing was even more valuable than before, and Iron Head became an extremely useful tool. Rocky Helmet became one more item choice in addition to Leftovers and Shed Shell. And certain Skarmory variants even ran counter, that was to handle the good amount of physical threats that didn't mind Brave Bird and did a lot of damage, like Mega Scizor and Bisharp. In general, Skarmory saw itself being played specially defensive a lot more, maybe about as much as its physical variant, because of what a great fairy type check it was, the majority of which were going to be going for the special side. It became more important to keep this Skarmory at high health so as to win the Hazard War once the opponent's setter was dead, but certain threats like Mega Charizard Y and Thunderous made that hard. That said though, you guys get it by now, nothing does Skarmory's job as well as Skarmory, except for maybe Ferrothorn. And now that it can defog as well, that niche is even more specific. And you guys may have noticed that we didn't talk at all about Skarmory and VGC, which is crazy since it seems very good in singles, but why is that? Well first of all, being weak to electric attacks is very very bad in VGC, as the move discharges absolutely everywhere, and every generation 
generation, there's always a very good electric special attacker. What's more, Skarmory's slow play style of setting up and whirlwinding simply just doesn't work as well in doubles. It can easily be focused for a quick knockout, and it's just more likely that some special attacker will be there to take it out. Not to mention that entry hazards aren't nearly as prominent in doubles as they are in singles. And this is simply because not as much switching out occurs in doubles. This is the case where the Pokemon strengths just really don't work for the format, especially because there were better supportive flying types that could give Tailwind support and do more damage. And that's it. So in conclusion, yeah, Skarmory is amazing in singles. It's been overused every single generation doing the same thing, walling, supporting, and setting up hazards. That said, maybe what sets Skarmory apart is that it has the tools to continue evolving. Though its game plan has remained pretty much the same, it's always getting new things that allow it to keep up. At its core though, it's just a very good Pokemon in singles. It's wonderful at what it does, and barring any big meta shifts, will probably stay that way for a long time to come. Thanks for watching everyone. As always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And of course, as I always say, comment on which Pokemon you want to see next. Also, thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos. Also, follow my crew on these social media platforms. And yeah, that's it. Have a nice day, everyone.